Satan, Sunday Saint, fooling your neighbor, that's what you think, reading the good book, singing the hymns, come Monday morning and it's back to a life of sin. The foundation did pursue programs and activities for which it had neither sought nor achieved permission to undertake. Such was the case even before the completion and transfer of the Presidential Library in 2004. As such, representation, representation by the foundation to donors was a misrepresentation of the approval, organizational tax status allowing it to raise funds for the Presidential Library and related programs therein. In these pursuits, the foundation failed the organizational and operational test 501c3 Internal Revenue Code 7.25.3. Additionally, the intentional misuse of donated public funds. The foundation falsely attested that it received funds and used them for charitable purposes, which was in fact not the case. Rather, the foundation pursued an array of activities, both domestically and abroad. Some may be deemed philanthropic, albeit unimproved, while others, much larger in scope, are properly characterized as profit-oriented and taxable undertakings of private enterprise, again failing the operational tests for philanthropy, philanthropy referenced above. The investigation clearly demonstrates that the Foundation was not a charitable organization, per se, but in point of fact, was, was a closely held family partnership. As such, it was governed in a fashion in which it sought in large measure to advance the personal interests of its principles as detailed within the financial an analysis of this submission and further confirmed within the supporting documentation and evidence section. Hey friends, welcome back. It is wonderful to have you. You're going to love this interview. We're going to go deep, deep, deep into all the criminality coming out of Little Rock, the FBI, the DOJ. You'll recall they landed a 757 in Little Rock on 8818. And boy, we still have people saying nothing's going on, nothing's happening, nothing will ever change. I've got Corey Lynn from Corey'sDigs.com on the line right now to school you all and to let you know there is a lot, a great deal happening. CNN reported that just over a month after falling and fracturing three ribs, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg reveals she is almost repaired. The 85-year-old justice said in an interview with NPR's Nina Totenberg at an event hosted by the Museum of the City of New York that she returned to her physical trainer immediately after the fall, but they did legs only. Yesterday, she said, however, we did the whole routine. News of the fall caused her legion of fans and liberals across the country to hold their collective breaths, fearful for the health of the so-called notorious RBG, who has reached celebrity status, as well as for the future of the court. From fellowshipoftheminds.com, Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg favors decriminalizing pedophilia and child sex trafficking. Posted by Dr. Eowyn. The legal definition of age of consent is as follows. Age of consent refers to the legally defined age at which, which a person is no longer required to obtain parental consent to get married. It also refers to the age at which a person is held to have the capacity to voluntarily agree to sexual intercourse. Sexual intercourse with a person under the age of consent may lead to criminal charges of statutory rape or sexual In assault. 1977, when Ginsburg was general counsel of the ACLU, something that most of us are not aware of, she co-authored with Brenda Feigen Fasto, Sex Bias in the U.S. Code. The 230-page Sex Bias in the U.S. Code identifies hundreds of federal laws alleged to discriminate against women and recommends an avalanche of government and social changes, including military draft and combat duty for women, legalization of prostitution, sex integration of prisons, reformatory schools and colleges and their activities including sports, all girls and all boys organizations and fraternities and sororities, 
changing the names of the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and Big Brothers of America to reflect sex integration. Elimination of the traditional family concept of husband as a breadwinner and wife as homemaker. Comprehensive government child care. Adoption of sex-neutral language, for example, artificial instead of man-made. Person, human, instead of man and woman. Plural nouns, they and them, instead of singular third-person pronouns. At the same time, however, Ginsburg and Feigen Fasto hypocritically insist that the U.S. Department of Labor retains its Women's Bureau. Ginsburg wrote on page 102 of Sex Bias in the U.S. Code, Eliminate the phrase carnal knowledge of any female, not his wife, who has not attained the age of 16 years, and substitute a federal, sex-neutral definition of the offense. A person is guilty of an offense if he engages in a sexual act with another person, and the other person is, in fact, less than 12 years old. Ginsburg and her co-author also recommend that the Mann Act be repealed, M-A-N-N. -N. The Mann Act is a federal law passed in 1910, which makes it a felony to engage in interstate or foreign commerce transport of any woman or girl for the purpose of prostitution or debauchery or for any other immoral purpose. From Sex Bias in the U.S. Code, pages 98 and 99, the Mann Act poses the invasion of privacy issue in an acute form. The Mann Act also is offensive because of the image of women it perpetuates. It was meant to protect from the villainous interstate and international traffic in women and girls. Those women and girls who have given a fair chance would, in all human probability, have been good wives and mothers and useful citizens. In other words, if Ruth Bader Ginsburg has her way, sexual abuse of children 12 years or older would not be a crime, nor would child sex trafficking. Ginsburg will be 84 next month. May President Trump be given the opportunity to nominate her replacement on the Supreme Court. The Bible says those who practice sexual immorality will not inherit the kingdom of God, but will be cast into eternal fire. What is sexual immorality? It's translated from the Greek word porneia, which means fornication. The Bible uses the word for any kind of sexual desire outside the covenant of marriage between a husband and wife, for whom God designed sex, that they may be one flesh. Since God created sex, he gets to define it, so any kind of sex outside his definition of marriage is immoral and idolatrous. Premarital sex, adultery, homosexuality, porn, and masturbation, since sex is not intended for one person but a husband and wife. Jesus said if a man lusts after a woman, he's committed adultery in his heart. The culture will say sex is okay as long as two people love each other, but causing someone else to sin is not loving. 1 Corinthians 7-2 says because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. When sex is enjoyed between a husband and wife, they protect one another from sinning. In a list of sins, sexual immorality is often at the top. Every other sin is outside the body, but sexual sins are committed against the body. It's self-destruction, desecrating that which was made in God's image. The body is for the Lord, and for those united with Christ, sexual immorality dishonors that union, defiles the temple of the Holy Spirit, and is likened to sleeping with prostitutes. Hebrews 13.4 says God will judge the sexually immoral. Ephesians 5.3 says that sexual immorality must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints, when we understand the text. Some of those recommendations including th included things that the government could change now. For instance, the differential age of consent when it comes to anal sex versus uh, vaginal sex. Yeah. Uh, is that something that the government... Yeah, that's change? something that we're, uh, we're very much looking forward uh, to moving, uh, moving on uh, in, in short order. Mm -hmm. The government announced today it is repealing what it calls an outdated law, a section of the criminal code that makes it illegal for anyone under 18 to have anal intercourse unless they are husband and wife, even though age of consent in Canada is 16. The proposed amendment would ensure that, in law, all forms of consensual sexual activity are treated the same. The minister says 69 charges were laid under that section of the law in 2014-15, though none led to convictions.
If Jesus had been a baker instead of a carpenter, would Jesus bake a cake for a gay wedding? Of course not. In Matthew 19, 4 through 6, Jesus said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. If a man and another man have romantic feelings for one another, that's lust and a perversion of God's design. If they decide to marry each other and stage a wedding, what they're doing is playing dress up and pretending to have something only meant for a man and his wife. If you want to argue that Jesus would bake a wedding cake for them, you're saying Jesus would go along with this charade that a gay wedding can even be a thing, let alone a God-honoring thing, and Jesus would contradict himself. Do you understand that when Jesus referenced the creation story in Genesis to explain how God made Made marriage, he was explaining how he made marriage. Jesus created marriage and sex for marriage. Jesus was there at Sodom and Gomorrah when God rained down fire and brimstone for their sexual perversion. Jesus will cast the sexually immoral into the lake of fire at the last judgment. Jesus would never encourage a person to do something he has promised he will judge with fire. He laid down his life so people would repent from sin such as this, so they would have forgiveness and then go and sin no more when we understand the text. Some 40 gay couples have got married in a mass wedding in Brazil, amid fears President-elect Jair Bolsonaro might restrict same-sex marriage. The event in São Paulo was crowdfunded by gay rights movement Casa One. It's crazy, right, says this newlywed. We were thinking about getting married in April. Then all that happened and we told each other, what can we do? Then this platform decided to organize this collective wedding and they helped us a lot. We're living in a difficult moment right now, says activist Luana Hansen. I believe we've had moments of tolerance in our country in which people tolerated you the way you were, but now nobody tolerates anything. Bolsonaro will take office on the 1st of January. He's previously stated he'd be incapable of loving a gay son. Today's question is, what was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? In this video, I'll answer that question from a biblical perspective. And afterwards, as always, I'll share some helpful resources. So stick around until the end. The biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah is recorded in Genesis chapter 18 and 19. Genesis chapter 18 records the Lord and two angels coming to speak with Abraham. The Lord informed Abraham that the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous, Genesis 18, verse 20. Verses 22 through 33 record Abraham pleading with the Lord to have mercy on Sodom and Gomorrah because Abraham's nephew Lot and his family lived in Sodom. Genesis chapter 19 records the two angels disguised as human men visiting Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot met the angels in the city square and urged them to stay at his house. The angels agreed. The Bible then informs us, before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Genesis chapter 19 verses 4 through 5. The angels then proceeded to blind all the men of Sodom and Gomorrah and urge Lot and his family to flee from the cities to escape the wrath that God was about to deliver. 
Lot and his family fled the city, and then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities. Genesis chapter 19, verse 24. In light of the passage, the most common response to the question, what was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, is that it was homosexuality. That is how the term sodomy came to be used to refer to anal sex between two men, whether consensual or forced. Clearly, homosexuality was part of why God destroyed the two cities. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to perform homosexual gang rape on the two angels, who were disguised as men. At the same time, it is not biblical to say that homosexuality was the exclusive reason why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were definitely not exclusive in terms of the sin in which they indulged. Ezekiel chapter 16 verses 49 through 50 declares, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. The Hebrew word translated detestable refers to something that is morally disgusting, and it is the exact same word used in Leviticus chapter 18 verse 22 that refers to homosexuality as an abomination. Similarly, Jude 7 declares, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. So again, while homosexuality was not the only sin in which the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah indulged, it does appear to be the primary reason for the destruction of the cities. Those who attempt to explain away the biblical condemnations of homosexuality claim that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was inhospitality. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah were certainly being inhospitable. There is probably nothing more inhospitable than homosexual gang rape. But to say God completely destroyed two cities and all their inhabitants for being inhospitable clearly misses the point. While Sodom and Gomorrah were guilty of many other horrendous sins, homosexuality was the reason God poured fiery sulfur on the cities, completely destroying them and all of their inhabitants. To this day, the area where Sodom and Gomorrah were located remains a desolate wasteland. Sodom and Gomorrah serve as a powerful example of how God feels about sin in general and homosexuality specifically. An anchor in India is dead and her colleague has been taken into custody for questioning. 27-year-old Radhika Kaushik fell to her death from her fourth story building on December 14th. Now authorities are investigating whether the fall was an accident, a murder, or a suicide. Her co-anchor Rahula Wafi was reportedly at the flat when the incident occurred. Police say the two anchors were allegedly inebriated and say they recovered bottles of alcohol from the apartment. Local reports also say the anchor's colleague said he was in the bathroom when he heard the woman in a heated argument on the phone. He reportedly then heard a sound of someone falling. The Indian Express, meanwhile, reported the woman's family believes foul play took place and has filed a murder complaint. The incident reportedly occurred around 3.30 in the morning. Police arrived after receiving a call from the building's security guard. For Global One, a I'm Julia. A County woman who left her two young daughters in a hot car to die has now been sentenced to 40 years years in prison. 20-year-old Amanda Hawkins, this woman left her one-year-old and three-year-old daughters in a car back in 2017 last year for more than 15 hours. Hawkins was inside a friend's house at the time. She initially lied about what had happened to the girls, saying that they were taking a walk and smelling flowers and then collapsed. 18-year-old Kevin Frankie is also accused of murder and manslaughter in the same case, and he's set to go on trial on January 22nd. 31-year-old Jennifer Delgado was arrested after bringing a six-year-old girl to the hospital last week. Police haven't released how she's related to the child, but doctors say the girl was seriously neglected in filthy clothes, hair falling out, teeth decaying, and severely malnourished. When my kids were six years old, they weighed 45, 50 pounds. And a six-year-old weighing 19 pounds, that's the, that's the weight of a child that turns one. Yolanda Valenzuela is on the Bear County Child Welfare Board. In her 15 years of advocacy, child abuse has skyrocketed, rising 36% in Bear County just from 2014 to 2017. In the past two years, several sickening high-profile cases. In May, Deborah Darden arrested when police found her 16-year-old daughter starved, underdeveloped and covered with signs of abuse. And back in 2016, a neighbor called police when they found two children chained up, emaciated and injured in a backyard. Several neighbors after the fact said we heard something. And now last week's six year old victim. When a child starve is they start losing their hair or their hair 
turns lighter. This child had patches of hair missing. Valenzuela says red flags can also be what you don't see. At six, a child should be in school. Why is this child not coming to school and who went to check on this child? She says the entire community must take responsibility. Because suicide rates are at epidemic proportions in our country, 45,000 people each year take their own lives, I carry copies of my book, How to Battle Depression and Suicidal Thoughts, and give them away to people. I am just telling you that this was a most timely book that I just got given because this is exactly the way I have been feeling. How to Battle Depression and Suicidal Thoughts is a perfect. I don't know how to explain it. It hit home with me, for sure. So please, you're gonna read it. I certainly am, and I will get in touch with you too, darling. It was 24 minutes that changed one family forever. He was just happy, and we had no warning. The mother of 23-year-old Andrew Black left heartbroken tonight. We know that he walked into a gun shop at 11.02. They ran a background check on him. The credit card receipt from the gun was 11.26 and somewhere between three and four that afternoon, he shot himself. Andrew's parents say a wait time of 24 hours rather than 24 minutes could have saved his life. So they tucked a political call to action into his obituary. We ask that you work for legislation that imposes a reasonable waiting period between firearm purchase and possession to guard against impulsive acts of violence. Nine states in Washington, D.C. require a mandatory waiting period. Vermont isn't one of them. It was way too easy for this 23-year-old kid to go down and, and buy a gun. If nothing but 24 hours to, to just cool down and realize that it wasn't the answer. Andrew's parents pleading for change before another family shares their grief. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Do you ever consider suicide? I have, yeah. I actually tried attempting it a few times when I was a teenager. I'm 23 now. Do you ever have suicidal thoughts? Yes, frequently. Did you ever attempt to commit suicide? I did once. What happened? It was halfway through. It's just like I just realized I didn't want to do it. Do you ever think about suicide? Yes. Do you ever think about suicide? Yeah. I tried it before. What did you do? Uh, I took pills. I tried to like shoot myself. And I tried to hang myself. Three different occasions? Six different occasions. Question. What is the Christian view of suicide? What does the Bible say about suicide? In this video, we'll consider six individuals in scripture who committed suicide. Then we'll look at some others who were in despair, but yet trusted in the Lord through their storms. At the end of the video, I'll point you to some helpful resources, so stick around for that. The Bible mentions six specific people who committed suicide, Abimelech, Saul, Saul's armor bearer, Ahithophel, Zimri, and Judas. Five of these men were noted for their wickedness. The exception to Saul's armor bearer, nothing is said of his character. Some consider Samson's death an instance of suicide because he knew his actions would lead to his death, but Samson's goal was to kill Philistines, not himself. The Bible views suicide as equal to murder, which is what it is, self Murder. God is the only one who can decide when and how a person should die. We should say with the psalmist, my times are in your hands. God is the giver of life. He gives and he takes away. Suicide, the taking of one's own life, is ungodly because it rejects God's gift of life. No man or woman should presume to take God's authority upon themselves to end his or her life. 
Some people in scripture felt deep despair in life. Solomon, in his pursuit of pleasure, reached the point where he hated life. Elijah was fearful and depressed and yearned for death. Jonah was so angry at God that he wished to die. Even the Apostle Paul and his missionary companions at one point were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. However, none of these men committed suicide. Solomon learned to fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Elijah was comforted by an angel, allowed to rest, and given a new commission. Jonah received admonition and rebuke from God. Paul learned that although the pressure he faced was beyond his ability to endure, the Lord can bear all things. This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. So, according to the Bible, suicide is a sin. It is not the greatest sin. It is no worse than other evils in terms of how God sees it, and it does not determine a person's eternal destiny. However, suicide has a deep and lasting impact on those left behind. The painful scars left by a suicide do not heal easy. May God grant His grace to each one who's facing trials today. And may each of us take hope in the promise, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, Lord will be saved.